good morning, everyone. Uh, we're entering our period of studying God's Word together as we continue our study of the divided kingdom, which actually this is uh, our last class of the divided kingdom in terms of our 17 periods of the Bible. Um, we will jump into our text uh, right after we have a prayer. So let's go to God in prayer first, please. Our Father in heaven, we praise you for your word. We thank you so much that you are a faithful God who always does what he says, always means what he says, always keeps his promises. We know that we can count on you, and we pray for uh, added faith and strength every day uh, to trust in you, who you are, what you've done, to, to be grateful for all of your blessings and all of the things that you've done for us in our life, to learn lessons, uh, both good and bad, from um, Israel and Judah as we go through this study Help us to always draw closer to you, to cling to you the way Hezekiah did. Father, thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. All right, so uh, we're not going to be able to review the kings one by one. So what I'm going to do is just put them up on the, on the screen kind of as a whole because I'm, I'm more concerned at this point for you all seeing the kind of the general flow of the dates and the kings and especially the prophets in relation to the kings. So Obadiah uh, came in the, in the time of, of Jehoram around 845 BC. And what, what was the basic message of Obadiah? Do you remember? What was the mnemonic for that? When you think of Obadiah, Obed-Edom. Good, good. Oh, bad Edom. Okay, so they preached to the Edomites, or he preached to the Edomites. And then you had Joel, who spoke to Judah, and he said, look, this locust plague is, is what? It's no joke. All right, it's no joke. Okay, so if you think of Joel, think that's no joke. This locust plague, it's a sign of worse things to come. Don't ignore that. Um, because God will, God will bring worse judgment. Uh, and then I broke this up just so we could see the chronology a little bit more accurately, which it's always hard to have a perfect chronology, but I wanted you to see how this is broken up. And then the prophet Jonah, uh, and Adam and I have a little bit of a disagreement on the summary on this. I just thought of this this morning, and it helps me a lot. So you can take it or leave it. That's fine. This is not an official thing that you have to memorize. But for me, when I when I see the word Joe, um, it rhymes with no. Okay? And Jonah told God no. He, he rebelled against God. And then I thought, well, what a nah, you know, nah, Joe, nah, how do I, you know, not, not them. No, not them. Okay? Because God was a compassionate God, but who did God want to show compassion to? Yeah, the Assyrians. And Jonah says, no, not them. No, not them. Don't show compassion on them. And even when he does, he, Jonah's still not happy about it. So he's a rebellious prophet. Um, so if you think Joe, not, think no, not them. That, that just helps me. I remember it, even if it's corny. All right, so uh, a, uh, a and H, okay. <laughs> Yeah, Adam gives me an amen, but we've got Amos, and Adam came up with a mess, so I don't know, you know, they're, they're, they're all a little bit corny, but see, corniness is memorable, right? So you're going you're gonna to remember, man, that no not thing was corny, but hey, no not them, I remember it. Um, Amos, the people are a mess, judgment is coming, judgment is coming on Israel. Um, H for Hosea, we, we connected with another H word, which was what? Heart, right? It breaks God's heart to see his people in so much sin. And then we had Isaiah and Micah, who were contemporaries. In Isaiah, what was the message of Isaiah? I save. Trust in me. I will save you. Don't trust in all these foreign nations and your foolish idols that aren't gods. And then Micah, uh, Micah, we, we had the mnemonic, my city, because the sin of Israel has now reached Jerusalem, my city. And then finally this morning, we're going to see Israel is destroyed in 722 B.C. So we're going to talk this morning about those final, or well, the final king of Israel, Hoshea. And then we'll talk about Hezekiah as well. Now, as we're studying this, we, Adam and I also realize it's really complex sometimes, jumping back and forth from this account to this account and this event to this event. So what we want to do to help us remember our study is kind of package our studies in something that is both memorable and applicable that kind of sums up where we're, what we're talking about. So we're covering four different chapters, a lot of different things that happen. But here's what I want you to see as the general theme that emerges. 
Repentance brings restoration in Judah. Defiance brings desolation in Israel. We'll be looking at those two concepts because Hezekiah in Judah, he leads this widespread repentance. And there's re- uh, restoration and rejoicing in, in Judah. But then Hoshea, the king there, he defies God and he just kind of helps Israel continue in their defiance of God until finally all the things that the prophet said would come true. Israel would be desolated. According to Google, to desolate means to make a place bleakly and depressingly empty and bare. It's exactly what happens in Israel. And I might add, it's exactly what happens in our own lives when we defy God. Our, our own lives become depressingly bare and empty when we defy the Lord. But when we repent, things are restored. There's rejoicing. And that's what I want us to see practically in our own lives as we study this as well. So let's talk about the character of Hezekiah. Look in 2 Kings 18, please. 2 Kings 18. Of course, we looked at verse 4 for the Lord's Supper talk. But 2 Kings 18 show us that Hezekiah was not just a good king. He was a great king. In fact, he was one of the greatest kings that Judah had ever had. And he's compared to David. Look in verse uh, 3 through 6. It says, He did right, 2 Kings 18, 3, He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places. He broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him. He kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. He's, again, so righteous. He, he's compared to, to David. Um, in fact, I think that's one of the points that the chronicler makes, because Chronicles looks forward to the Messianic age. It was written af- actually after the exile, looking forward to the Messianic age to this king who would come and restore the temple and reunite the tribes. And this is what Hezekiah does. He tears down all the high places in the land. He breaks down all the idols. He, he cleanses the evil from the land. And he also puts his trust in God and even clings to him. Uh, when I see the word cling, and I don't know, maybe your translations use a different word. The New American Standard says, says cling. I always think about that rogue sock in the dryer. When I have dress socks, you know, socks that I wear with suits, you know, you've got to kind of match your socks together. And so I tie my dress socks together and it never fails. I'm folding my laundry and I get to tying my dress socks together and I always get to one where there's just one dress sock and there's no matching sock to tie it together with. And at first I blame myself and I get frustrated. Oh, I lost my sock. Well, how, did I, how did this happen? How do you lose a sock? And then it dawns on me. I, I know where it is. Go back to the dryer. There it is. Clung to the side of the dryer. I thought I got all the laundry out. But lo and behold, there was that rogue sock. Stuck to the side of the dryer. That's how it should be with us and God. We're stuck to Him. And people in the world, when they're doing wicked things and they want us to participate with them, they find that we're missing. Where are they? How come they're not doing what we're doing? How come we're not missing? We're stuck to God. We're clinging to our Lord and everybody in the world, they should know where to find us because we're always clung to God, stuck to Him. Here's a question. Do you think people were happy when Hezekiah destroyed, destroyed all these idols in the land? Do you think everybody was happy about that? No way. I don't think so. <laughs> no. No. He would have ruffled some feathers, made a lot of people angry. That was their religion. That's what they lived for. He's the king, though. He has authority. He can... He can do what he wants. But true repentance doesn't care what unrepentant people think. Truly repentant people bring restoration because they care far more about what God thinks than what unrepentant people think. Now, let me ask this question as well. Who is Hezekiah's father? Remember? Ahaz. One of the worst, most evil Wicked kings of either kingdom, really, but but of Judah especially. Ahaz sacrificed children in fire to his gods. He made alliances with Assyria. And how did he pay for that alliance? 
by cleaning out the treasury of the temple of God. He even shut the doors of God's temple. He closed down all the temple service. Application, you don't have to be like your parents. Now, some of us want to be like our parents. That's how it's supposed to be. You should want to be like your parents. Your parents should set such a good example that you want to emulate that, but not everybody has that. And so if you had an evil, wicked mother or father, and you don't want to be like them, the good news is repentance is not dependent on your relationship with your parents. It's not dependent on DNA, nor is it dependent on parental influence. So I just see four things about repentance right there, jumping out in the text from Hezekiah, that repentance cleanses evil, clings to God, couldn't care less what unrepentant people think, and chooses God's path despite our DNA or our parental influence. Any other comments or questions on those four verses about Hezekiah's character? We're going to keep going in terms of the, what he does in the temple. But how about from that text? Any comments or questions or other things that jump out at you? That are helpful. <clears throat> All right, that's fine. So let's keep going then to see. Oh, did someone have a comment? Oh, Carol. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thought I heard you. Go ahead, Carol. It was important that he didn't. He, he accepted the truth and he made the people do yeah. that. Yeah, so he was a really good leader, you know, and, and leaders, their repentance inspires repentance in their followers. So yeah, that's a really, a really good thought. <clears throat> All right, uh, Hezekiah restores the temple. Now let's turn to Second Chronicles. This is where we'll be for a little bit. Second Chronicles 29. Second Chronicles 29. Because here's something really... Amazing. <clears throat> All that stuff that we just read about him, tearing down the idols in the land, that was not the first thing that he did when he became king. There was something else to attend to that was even more important. And that was the temple of God. He needed to fix God's house first. He understood the temple was the heartbeat of God's people, because that's you know where God uh, was to dwell. If the temple was in disrepair and neglected, really it was, a, it was a sign of the people's neglect of God himself. And so I, let me point out real quick, look in 2 Chronicles 28, 28, the chapter right before, look at verse 24, because I, I want to remind us what his father Ahaz did. Verse 24, of chapter 28. Moreover, when Ahaz gathered together the utensils of the house of God, he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces, and he closed the doors of the house of the Lord and made altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem. Um, and if you'll recall, God severely punished Judah because of what Ahaz did. He caused the Edomites to attack Judah, the Philistines to come in and attack Judah, even the northern kingdom of Israel attacked Judah because of Ahaz's wickedness. And in all these cases, Judah was greatly weakened in their influence in the world. Their power was greatly weakened because of the sin. And Hezekiah understood the key to regaining power, to regaining influence in the world, was to recognize how sinful they had been and repent and restore, repair the temple of God and return to the God who dwells there. So now we're in 2 Chronicles 29. Now let's... Let's read uh, verse 3 down through verse 11. It's just so powerful. In the first year of his reign, this is Hezekiah, in the first month he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. So you see this is a direct reversal of what his father had done. He opened the doors. He repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the square on the east. Then he said to them, Listen to me, O Levites, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the house of the Lord the God of your fathers, and carry the uncleanness out from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord, have turned their backs. They also have shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps. They've not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. 
Therefore the wrath of the Lord was against Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of terror, of horror, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that His burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before Him, to minister to Him, and to be His ministers, and to burn incense. He's putting the priests back to work. He says, it's in my heart. To turn back. Reestablish this covenant. Get the priests back to work. Can you imagine God's temple being shut down to where not only were the people living in sin, they had absolutely no way to atone for their sin. It gets worse because in verse 5, it said that he commanded them to remove the uncleanness from the holy place. They had actually put idols in the temple of God. In fact, look in verse 16. We get more clarity there. Verse 16. So the priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And every unclean thing which they found in the temple of the Lord, they brought out to the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites received it to carry it out to the Kidron Valley. See, actually in the most holy place, in the inner part of the temple, they had set up idols. And now they're going in and they're ripping those out. And they are burning them, destroying them in the Kidron Valley. That's how bad the sin of the people got. Well, cleansing the temple not only meant getting rid of the idols, it meant a lot of blood shed. They sacrificed a lot of animals, not only to cleanse the sin of the people, they had to sprinkle it around the temple area, just like the law of Moses had had prescribed. And it took them 16 days to complete this process. And once the temple was purified by blood and the sin of the people was atoned for by blood, then... Hezekiah, he reinstates the musicians. He reinstates the way David had set up the worship at the command of of God through his prophet. And it was such a joyous occasion. Look at verse 29. Verse 29, At the completion of the burnt offerings, the king and all who were present with him bowed down and worshipped. Moreover, verse 30, King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with joy and bowed down and worshiped. Look at verse 36, last verse 36. Then Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people because the thing came about so suddenly. <clears throat> Repentance is about fixing God's house first. Now, we don't have a physical temple today, but the New Testament teaches that what is the temple? There's actually two answers to that. Okay, yeah, so our bodies and what? There's one more temple. The church. The church. Okay, the church. And of course, Jesus, you know, Jesus spoke of his own body as a temple as well. But in terms of the New Testament, in terms of application to us, yeah, the church is the spiritual temple of the Lord that needs fixing first, right? When we repent, we need to focus on, on the Lord's house. But, but really, I think primarily when we're talking about personal repentance, we're talking about our own temples, our, our own bodies. Paul says in 1 Corinthians six nineteen, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and that you are not your own? And before we were Christians, I mean, the temple was shut down. The doors of the temple they were just closed down. There was no place for God there. But then when we became Christians, we were no longer empty shells. The house of God was fixed, and we were filled, and He dwells with us. And even as Christians, when we sin against God, when we defy the Lord, sometimes we can neglect God's temple. And we allow our bodies, our, our, the souls within our bodies, to fall into disrepair. And we need to be like Hezekiah and make God's temple our top priority again. That, that means removing any idols that we've set up in our hearts. and also means seeking God's cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. And repentance also fills us when we do that with tremendous joy. When our relationship to God is restored, man, it's just such a joyful thing because now we're whole again. We're, we're complete. We feel like we are living the way that God designed us to live spiritually, and it's a time for worship. It's a time for singing. It's a time uh, for rejoicing. Anything else from chapter 29? Comments or questions? Joe? Well, the one thing that I was thinking about uh, is also, uh, I believe in Matthew, where he said, you know, as far as 
take the speck out of your own eye before you look into the others. And what you need to address yourself first. Mm -hmm. Just like what he's talking about. Yeah. I believe in why when they were coming back in, it was about those build the temple. Don't worry about your house. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, you start with yourself first. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who make it their life's mission to fix the spiritual temple of the church without fixing their own temple of their own body and their own soul. And you need to do that first, right? Hezekiah said before, even before he fixed the, the temple, he said, it's in my heart. I have repented. I know how sinful I am. Now, once you fix your own temple, now you can work on the, the spiritual temple of the church and help, and then ultimately, you know, help the world. But it starts with you. Yeah, I like that thought. Um, I saw another hand, Debbie, and then Herb. That last scripture that said God has blessed their work because it was done so quickly. And I just said repentance can be quick. You know, it can be repentance when we are convicted or we see something that needs to change, we have to do it quick. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so repentance can be quick and it should be quick. Uh, I, I love that last phrase there. You know, they rejoice because it, it happened so suddenly. It was like, Within 16 days, I mean, the temple is back up and running. Everybody's cleansed. Well, not everybody's cleansed, but for the most part, uh, people are cleansed and, and things are back in action. And that, that really was relatively quick. And so often it's easy to say, you know, well, I'm repenting and I'll kind of get to that later. Like eventually I'll fix this, but there's no urgency about it. And Hezekiah was very urgent in his repentance. And I, I really think that's a great point, Debbie. Her. Which just reinforces what I was getting ready to say, Debbie, that, that we, we often think of the culture corrupting the king and the common people and the royalty and all that. But when you see it was in the inner court, it was the priests. And the reason the people switched is because they're following. And when you corrupt the leadership, it, it, the people follow them off into corruption. And when you fix the leadership, when the leadership dedicates to doing the right thing, the people will follow that as well. And they were being sheep, just like Jesus said. And it's just really sad. It's just really, it's encouraging that they follow them properly, but it's sad that they spent so much time in corruption. Yeah, absolutely. That's so often the people that are condemned the most by the prophets are the religious leaders. And then look at Jesus. He comes on the scene. Who does he condemn the most? The religious leader. You know? So that's a warning to religious leaders to not kind of sit on our haunches and think, oh, I'm, I'm in the chair of Moses. I'm fine. You know, I'm a religious leader. And everybody, well, there's a lot of responsibility that comes along with that. You've got to take, got to take that seriously. So, yeah, really good thoughts. Uh, anyone else from chapter 29? <clears throat> Okay, well, let's look at the next chapter because he continues his restoration. He restores the Passover feast. Now, I want to remind you that in the law of Moses, God set aside three annual feasts that he wanted his people to travel to once a year. What were those three feasts? You have the Passover, obviously. What were the other two? Do you remember? Pentecost. Okay, yeah, the Feast of Pentecost. There was one more. Yeah, Feast of Booths. Good. Um, so one of the... Here's the thing, God, you know, God was not random in why he said to do things. One of the major reasons God told his people to do this was to unify his people. Remember, they were scattered throughout the land of Canaan. I mean, it wasn't like a huge land necessarily, but they're all spread out, and there are different 12 tribal allotments. And yet, once a year, everybody, doesn't matter what tribe you're from, you're traveling to Jerusalem and you're feasting and you're worshiping at the temple. You're reminding each other who you are and where you came from, that you are the people of God. You are his, his chosen nation. Now, what was the Passover meant to remind them of? Yeah, their escape from Egypt, right? God delivered them from, from slavery. So yes, they've been divided into northern and southern kingdoms, but they're all God's people. They all came from the same place. They were all rescued from, from slavery, delivered by the same God to be his holy nation. Yet what happened when the kingdom first divided that kept God's people from this unity? Yes. Uh, that was through the idols. Yeah. And you don't need to go down to 
Yeah, exactly. King Jeroboam the first, he sets up worship sites in Dan and Bethel. And the significance of the one in Bethel was that it was purposely placed there so that as you were traveling to Jerusalem, you would come to Bethel first. And hey, why go all the way to Jerusalem? Bethel's good enough, and we'll just stop here. So you couple that with the fact that both in Israel and in Judah, they set up worship on the high places, which means that you had people worshiping God on hills all throughout the land in random places, completely disunified, not worshiping together at all, worshiping God in their own way, in their own time, and in their own place. And God in the law, in Deuteronomy 12, he says, you will worship at the place where I choose. You will not worship at the high places. You will worship at the temple. But they hadn't been doing that for a long time, ever since the days of Solomon, like 250 years. Um, and so not only does Hezekiah come along and destroy the high places to reestablish unity, he also then reestablishes this Passover feast and uses it as an opportunity to unite the two divided kingdoms. Look in verses 5 uh, through 9 of chapter 30. 5 through 9, so they establish a decree to circulate a proclamation throughout all of Israel from Beersheba even to Dan so that they should come to celebrate the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not celebrated in great numbers as it was prescribed. And the couriers went through all, all Israel and Judah with the letters from the hand of the king and his princes, even according to the command of the king, saying, O sons of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Israel, that he may return to those of you who escaped and are left from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your fathers and your brothers who were unfaithful to the Lord God of their fathers so that he made them a horror as you see. Now do not stiffen your neck like your fathers, but yield to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God that his burning anger may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will find compassion before those who led them captive and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate. He will not turn His face away from you if you return to Him. Israel had already suffered so much at the hands of the Assyrians. They weren't completely destroyed yet, but they had been tremendously weakened as a nation. And Hezekiah from down south in Judah appeals to his northern brethren. He says, how much more wrath of God can you take? What, you know, aren't you tired of having God angry at you? The solution is simple. Stop hardening your necks. Stop, stop being so stubborn and come down here to Jerusalem and worship the Lord like he said to do. And how do most of the Israelites react to his invitation? It's, am it's amazing. I mean, after all they've suffered from the hand of the wrath of God, it says in verse 10, the second part, but they laugh them to scorn and mock them. Repentance and restoration in Judah, defiance and desolation in, in Israel. But the good news is some of them actually responded well. And they experience unity for the first time since the days of Solomon with their brethren down south. Look in verse 11 and 12. Nevertheless, some men of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princess commanded by the word of the Lord. It's hard to appreciate how wonderful it is to see that verse. God gave them one heart. It's been 250 years since they had a taste of this kind of unity between Israel and Judah at the temple. And plus, under Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, Israel and Judah, they were warring. They were fighting against one another. And now some of them are, are reunited. This, this is why I said that the chronicler, I think, is looking ultimately to the Messianic age because this is what Jesus would come to do. He's this king who has a great heart, who comes to restore God's temple, to build the church, and to unite people who were, no, who were not united. And this is what repentance does. It unites us with others who repent as well. 
Now, let me make one last point here, and I'll open it up to comments. This Passover feast is far from perfect. For one, the priests were not consecrated in time. And so the people of Israel needed, uh, well, let me say it this way. There were two things. Okay, The priests were not consecrated in time, and the people who were traveling from Israel didn't get there in time for the feast. So they put it off to the second month. Supposed to be in the first month, they put it off to, to the second month. Uh, and what's more, uh, look what happens in verse 18. This is just so, it's so fascinating to me. Look, 18 through 20. A multitude of the people, even many from Ephraim and Manasseh, Issachar and Zebulun, had not purified themselves, yet they ate the Passover otherwise than prescribed. For Hezekiah prayed for them saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. So the Lord heard Hezekiah and healed the people. Man, that is an interesting verse. I mean, here's a God who's so concerned about perfectly keeping absolutely every rule and every ceremonial law in, in the law of Moses. And yet, he makes an exception for these people whose hearts are in the right place, but whose circumstances hindered them from being purified. Maybe a couple things we can learn here. God is a compassionate God who takes, he does take our life circumstances into account when he judges. And secondly, it shows that he is the one who purifies, not the ritual cleansing procedures just like we talked about in the Lord's Supper this morning. Yes, he gave them physical emblems of animal blood and you know, cleansing water and all that, but that's not what actually did the cleansing. It was God himself. And if God chooses to cleanse you, he can make that call because he is the healer. And he sees Hezekiah making this, this concession on, on their behalf. Um, repent, uh, let's see, I wanted to say one more thing about that. just want to make sure. <clears throat> okay, so repentance isn't always perfect. When we repent, we want to strive for perfection, right? We want, to, we want to take God's rules absolutely seriously, make sure we do what he tells us to do. But God sees our hearts, and he knows how hard we're trying, even if we don't get everything exactly right. God's rules matter, but in the end, our relationship will, with him will make up for our imperfect rule keeping. And again, I think this is part of the chronicler's foreshadowing of Jesus, that here's Hezekiah who makes intercession on behalf of the people who could not cleanse themselves, who could not possibly be there without Hezekiah, this righteous king's intervention on their behalf. And it's kind of the same with us and, and Jesus. So a lot of depth there. And Obviously, you have to be careful with this point, right? Because people who are looking for an excuse to sin, they'll run away with stuff like this. You know, oh, you know, God doesn't care about rules. It's about relationship, not rules. And so the rules don't matter. And no, 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 too far. <laughs> too far. But relationship is the most important thing. And the Lord does, does see our hearts even when we're not perfect in our, in our obedience. And especially especially after they've been so wicked, and these are just initial efforts to, to change and to repent, and, and they're just not perfect, but they're trying. Comments or questions about that? Maybe I opened a can of worms. I don't know. But uh, anything about chapter 30 uh, from that text? Yes? I think sometimes when we're teaching others, I think the uh, people that are um, not baptized or uh, don't know the Lord, they feel like they need to be perfect before they can come to the Lord. And it's important that we show them that not everything has to be changed right away. It, we're, it's to, we're told it's a walk. Yeah. It's not, it, we're not there instantaneously. Right. So we just have to have the heart that's willing to change the things that we know they need changing. Yeah, that's a really good point. People do get that idea. Like, how, how, I want to become a Christian, but I, I want to straighten everything about my life up first, and then I'll get baptized. No, <laughs> that's backwards. <laughs> yeah, you get baptized, let Jesus straighten up your life, right? And then, as you said, I like that. You know, it's a... 
only one. Yeah. Back in, up your life. Amen. He's the only one that can straighten him. You can't straighten up your life without Jesus. That's that's the point. And and I like that. It's it's a walk. It's a journey. It's a walk, not a step. All right. Oh, I took a step. I repented, and now I'm done with repentance for the rest of my life. No, our whole life is repenting and drawing closer to God's example. Good point, Tim. I was going to say we need to do the same thing when we are dealing with with others who become Christians. I mean, sometimes we, and I think that, that was the, the light of what you're saying. So mm-hmm. we want them to you know everything that we've learned, and maybe some of us have spent our whole life learning some things, and and we expect that, and and it doesn't work that way. Yeah. yeah. You, you have to internalize this a certain amount. Your other point about the yoke of a can of worms, even in, in Numbers 9, you know, this comes up. Yeah. Um, it comes up before. You see the same type of attitude from God. These people wanted to, to worship and had a question about the fact that they were unclean, where this comes from. And, you know, what he sets up sounds very absolute, but it's an answer to a question. Mm-hmm. What to do? And God is very fast to answer questions. And, uh, and see the hearts even in that situation. Where it's, it's yeah, definitely. And I, and I think this was kind of inspired by the Numbers 9 thing. Like, hey, they, they couldn't do it back then, and so they asked God, and God told Moses, it's okay, you can take it in the second month if it doesn't work out. You know, So, so yeah, that, um, that's a really good point. And, and I like your point, too. Once somebody comes up out of the waters of baptism, many times we as Christians, we put unrealistic expectations on them right away. And they're called babes in Christ, right? You don't yell at a baby like, hey, why aren't you crawling yet? You know, what's your problem? Or, you know, or then when they're a toddler, like, why aren't you an Olympic runner yet? Like, why are you so slow? I don't understand. You got to grab onto stuff? from the couch. I mean, how lame is that? Well, you know, that, that's where they're at, you know, but people, when they come out of the waters of baptism, that's how they're going to be. They're, they're going to be zealous. They're going to be excited, but at the same time, they're going to, you know, be kind of wobbly and not sure. And you need to be there to support them and, and encourage them and understand when things aren't perfect. I do have to move on. I see some hands. I really apologize. I, I got to make sure that I get uh, to this next part here because Hezekiah continues restoring the duties of the priests and the Levites in the next chapter in 31. Um, and we won't have time to get much into this, but basically now that the temple is restored and the priesthood is restored, he's got to make sure that all the Levites and priests are set in place with their proper uh, assignments, their proper duties to keep the temple going. And not only that, he needs to make sure they're getting paid for their services. And whose responsibility is that? The people. The people. People. They're supposed to pay tithes to God and also bring portions of their first fruits and sacrifices for the priests. And Hezekiah's repentance actually inspires, and this is what Carol was getting at earlier, it inspires the people to participate and to do their part, and the response is overwhelming. Look in verse 6. I just want you to notice one word there. Uh, thirty-one, uh, Chapter 31, verse 6. The sons of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities of Judah also brought in the tithe of oxen and sheep and the tithe of sacred gifts which were consecrated to the Lord their God and placed them in heaps. Again, that's New American Standard. Anybody have a different word for heaps there? Yes, he says the same, thing. same thing? Okay. All right, it's hard to beat that word heaps. I mean, that, that's such a great visual word. Like, that's how much these people brought. Just heaps, piles of contributions for the Lord's work. And what we see is, and I said it earlier because, you know, Carol made this point that when you see a leader repenting, that, man, that fires you up to repent as well. And all the people are getting on board and they're bringing heaps of contributions uh, to help restore the the house of the Lord. Um, Well, now we're going to turn to the defiance in Israel that brings desolation. Now, I'm not going to give, do like this where I'm going to give you, you know, 10 lessons about defiance. Basically, Everything about defiance is the opposite of repentance. So all these good things about repentance, defiance brings the exact opposite. So let's talk about the fall of Samaria. Look in 2 Kings uh, 17. That's where we'll be for the rest of our time. 2 Kings 17. And this happens under uh, King Hoshea. Under King Hoshea. And now, or Hoshea, maybe that's a better way to say it. Uh, Hoshea. Now, the big Assyrian king that we've talked about last month or so, that's been Tiglath-Pileser III. Well, he dies in 727 B.C., and now his son Shalmaneser V is ruling. Well, Shalmaneser, he puts King Hoshea under tribute, but Hoshea, after a while, he actually goes behind his back. He stops paying him tribute, and then he looks to another nation to help him from the Assyrians. And who, what nation was that? 
Egypt, the very nation Isaiah told them not to trust in. He said in Isaiah 31, 1, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because there are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Yet Hosea is defiant. He does it anyway. The people do it anyway. And Isaiah also said, the safety of Pharaoh will be your shame and the shelter in the shadow of Egypt, your humiliation. So Hosea stops paying tribute to Shalmaneser. So, verse uh, 4, verse 4 and 5, the king of Assyria found conspiracy in Hosea who had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, offered no tribute to the king of Assyria and had done year by year, or as he had done. So the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Then the king of Assyria invaded the whole land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. So he besieges the city, he starves them out for three years until eventually they're so weak they come and they take the capital of Samaria. Now Shalmaneser V was the king that started this, but the one who finished it and kind of put the nail in the coffin on uh, Samaria was Sargon, King Sargon II. And it used to be people thought Sargon was just a myth and the Bible just made this guy up. Until the 1800s they found a palace that was the palace or the fortress of Sargon. And in the palace, there was an inscription by Sargon uh, that said this, at the beginning of my rule in the first year I reigned, I set siege to and conquered Samaria. I carried away into captivity 27,290 persons who lived there. I took 50 fine chariots for my royal equipment. Well, the Assyrians, they would have left the poor and the elderly in the land and others who posed no threat to them. And then what they did is they replaced the Israelites that they murdered and the Israelites that they exiled with other foreigners that they had taken captive. And they put kind of this mix of people from different cultures in the land of Israel to kind of destroy their sense of national identity and kind of cause some confusion. Well, once the Gentiles settled in Israel, they weren't worshiping God right. So God sends lions to devour some of them to make sure they know whose land that is. And they send for a priest, and the priest comes and teaches them about Yahweh worship, but they, they still worship Yahweh, but they still worship all these other gods as well. And the irony of that is these now foreigners, these Gentile people that have moved into Israel, they're worshiping God in the exact same way that God's own people were. Well, let me skip ahead a little bit, because these mixed nations, they mixed together with the leftover Israelites in the land, and they created people known as the Samaritans. And the Samaritans are like half-blooded Jews. And the Samaritans give the Jews problems throughout their history. And by the New Testament times, the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. In fact, Jesus, he's speaking to a woman, a Samaritan woman at the well. And she says to him in John 4, 9, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And of course, Jesus tells a parable of the good Samaritan, which was also very disturbing to the Jews. Last thing here, the writer of Kings, he spends 16 verses telling us why Israel fell. And this not only would serve as a warning to future generations of Israelites who would learn from the book of Kings, but it was also to defend God's reputation. God's people were not desolated because God was too weak to protect them. They weren't desolated because God was unfaithful to his promises. They were desolated because of their constant defiance. So let's read um, as we close here, verse 13 through 18. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah throughout all his prophets and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments, my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers and which I sent to you through my servants, the prophets. However, they did not listen, but stiffened their neck like their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. They rejected his statutes and his covenant which he made with their fathers and his warnings with which he warned them, and they followed vanity and became vain. And went after the nations which surrounded them, concerning which the Lord had commanded them not to do like them. They forsook all the commandments of the Lord their God, made for themselves molten images, even two calves, and made an Asherah, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven, and served Baal. And then they made their sons and their daughters pass through the fire, and practiced divination and enchantments, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking Him. So the Lord was very angry with Israel, and removed them from His sight. None was left except the tribe of Judah. So now, in our 17 periods of Bible history, we are done with the divided kingdom, and it is now Judah alone. Defiance 
brings desolation. Repentance brings restoration. Not good time management there. Uh, but thank you all for your good comments all throughout class. Sorry I didn't leave any time at the end. <clears throat>